All right, I uh, want to provide a little bit of context to the writing that I've been doing. I've been talking about this more and more. And so for those of you interested, I am currently working on, actively working on, I would say two books. And right now, mainly one that I am aiming to get finished and published however soon I can. Um, this will be my first attempt at publishing a book, so I really don't know the entirety of the process in the slightest. I'm always learning about how that sort of thing works, uh, but all of this is new to me, of course, and I've not gone to school and studied English. I've not, uh, you know, I've not so much met that many authors, but I'm going through this process and learning, learning more and more as I go. Um, another book that I've sort of set aside for now Let's talk about that one first. So some of you might be familiar with Hunter S. Thompson, specifically Hunter S. Thompson's legendary book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Now, as you know, if you've read the book, it's this really insane book with a lot of drug usage and, uh, well, a lot of insanity. And, and just, it's very obscure and crazy. So I'm writing a book uh, called Biohacking in Los Angeles. So you can see the similarities in the title. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Biohacking in Los Angeles. And so I am really trying to frame it in a sort of style that Fear and Loathing is written in. And Hunter S. Thompson, his style of writing is called Gonzo Journalism. Right? So he's documenting life. He's a journalist of sorts, but mixed in with all of it is like these wild fictional scenarios and you don't know when you're reading his stuff what is fiction and what is fact because he was a crazy person and lived a very crazy lifestyle uh, but then a lot of the stuff that he's writing about you know just couldn't be humanly possible so it's, it makes for a very interesting read but also in some way puts the mirror up to humanity and you can learn about the laws of human nature by reading Hunter S. Thompson's work and it also makes for very fun reads as well. So I'm trying to do that in a sort of way, but within the biohacking communities of the world that's happening in the world today, all the different science uh, and, and technologies coming about that are able to potentially increase our lifespans, increase our cognitive capabilities and, uh, and our health span as well. And there's a lot going on within that world. And so last fall, I went to Los Angeles to the Biohacking Conference, which is uh, spearheaded by Dave Asprey, who uh, self-refers to as the father of biohacking. And I think there's a lot of validity to that. He may have been the first person to start using this term, biohacking. Today, it's used by a number of different people, and it's not just one man's term. Uh, but Dave Asprey is certainly a a head, key head figure, fountainhead figure in uh, biohacking. And so he does the annual biohacking conference. And so I went to that last year in Los Angeles. And having that experience, there was a lot of wild aspects to it and a lot of interesting things that I learned, but then also a lot of like darker aspects of humanity that I was able to analyze in some areas where I think, you know, is this really the pinnacle of biohacking? You know, there's a lot of vanity, a lot of different dynamics within that world that is not just about human progress. And there's a lot of egotism, let's say, and a lot of just doing it for fun and sort of a party aspect. There's this whole spectrum. And as I was there and just journaling along the way, and this is how any of the book ideas that I've come up with have come about, is by going through life, having experiences. And as I journal my day-to-day -day activities, I realize like, wow, there's actually a structure starting to come about that could potentially be a book. And so this is one that I went fully into after the conference, after my experience in Los Angeles, which was not just going to the conference, but some other dynamics as well. Um, after that, I just continued to write on this subject and to write the story of how it all took place. And it really started to shape up into a sort of gonzo journalistic style of writing. And I took that all throughout the winter, but then I stopped. I stopped writing it a few months ago, and mainly because I realized that this story is only half complete, maybe even only one third complete. And I personally have to go and experience some more things before I can complete this writing. There are more things that I have to learn, more places that I have to go, more people that I have to meet for this 
piece of work to be able to be brought to completion. And so a couple of things I have to do is, well, I think I have to go to the biohacking conference once more. It's in Miami this year and in a few weeks, I'm not gonna be able to go to this one. With any luck, I'm wondering if it's not going to be in Austin, Texas next year or maybe the year after. Dave Asprey is sort of moving his enterprise to Austin as is a lot of other people, not only in the biohacking communities, but just in the sort of uh, the zeitgeist of the moment. Joe Rogan, for example, Elon Musk as well. Elon Musk obviously being a technologist, not just in the realm of biohacking, certainly is Neuralink computer interface technology company is within that scope of things, but also just with Tesla and the other very sci-fi companies that he's running based out of Austin, Texas today. So there's something there. I've never been to Austin, but I don't think I can complete a book like Biohacking in Los Angeles until I've spent some time in Austin. I also think I need to go back to Los Angeles and I need to go to Burning Man. I need to go to the Burning Man Festival. So those are two things that I'm not going to be able to complete this summer because I'm going to Iceland. I'll be going to Iceland in just a few weeks and I'll be spending almost three months there. And so the biohacking in Los Angeles book aside, that one will be completed, but I have many more adventures and a lot more exploration to go until I can complete that. So for the other book that I have been working on off and on, and again, started just as journal entries and then began to manifest itself as more or less a manuscript for a book. That is, don't know the name exactly, maybe it will be called The Iceland Journals or perhaps The Snorri Journals. What is Snorri? Snorri, the Snorri Foundation, the Snorri Programs, that has been the organization that has helped me with my Iceland travels. Went there last summer, and that organization is taking me back there again this summer for an internship. They get their name from Snorri Thorfinnsson. Snorri Thorfinnsson was, by most accounts, the first human being of European descent to be born in the Americas, specifically in North America. So the Norse, so the Viking, the Vikings that moved across the Atlantic and settled Iceland and then Greenland and then Vinland for one or two years. They made a settlement in the Maritimes, what is now the Newfoundland area, what they called Vinland. They didn't stay there permanently. They abandoned their settlement, but they did interact with some indigenous people there as well. And so during that time, uh, Snorri Thorfinnsson was born on North American soil. And there's fairly decent documentation through uh, Icelandic sagas uh, that, that document that. And so this organization takes their name from Snorri Thorfinnsson, born in North America, roughly about 500 years before Columbus. That's one line of thought that I'm working through on in my book, in the Snorri journals, in the Iceland journals. And that is uh, sort of an idea of revisionist history. What would have happened if that was the route that Europeans colonized North America? or colonize the Americas through 500 years before Columbus? What if they continued that connection to North America and to the indigenous people? And if that was how Europe and the new world collided was through that route? Different ideas like that that I pursue in this book. Okay, so the Snorri journals and going there through the Snorri programs, uh, the goal of this organization is to connect North Americans of Icelandic descent, of which I am one, one of them. My mom's parents were first, generations, first generation Canadians. Their parents emigrated from Iceland during the time when many people were emigrating from Iceland because there was a volcanic eruption and, you know, life was hard in Iceland at the time. And the New World was opened up to a lot of settlement and people coming to the prairies to farm and make their, make their life here. Uh, so this organization connects people of Icelandic descent to Iceland. And so I went there and became very steeped in the culture, learned a lot, went to university lectures, traveled the island, met distant relatives, going back there again this summer. As I worked through my travel experiences there, my mind went to all these different topics, like how and why did the Norse settle the places that they did? And that 
brought me to a much larger topic of why do human beings migrate to begin with? And once you pursue that line of thought, you realize that really the whole story of human history, of human civilization as it is today, and as it was throughout history, is about migration. Migration is the story of humanity. And we sometimes forget that. You know, the world is the way it is today. You live here, I live there. We have these countries that are quite, uh, they seem very permanent in their existence. But every country is new to some degree, and human beings have been moving around forever. You know, that's the reason why we haven't speciated, is because we have been moving around, but we've intermingled so much that we haven't been isolated from each other to speciate. Whereas other primate groups have, gorillas, there's four distinct subspecies today of gorillas. And that's because they've been geographically separate from each other for long enough evolutionary periods that they're now four distinct subspecies. Human, humans, that has not happened. There have been other species of humans, and some of them we have integrated in with us. You know, I myself have about 5% Neanderthal DNA within me because I, have, uh, I am of European descent. And uh, most folks of European descent have some Neanderthal DNA within us because there was some intermingling of those populations. So in some sense, you know, we have other human species within us, but all of us are one singular species, Homo sapiens. You know, there's geographic differences and cultural differences, but we are still all one species because we have intermingled so much that none of us have been isolated from each other enough to speciate. Human beings, we move around. Homo migrato is another great term for our species, emphasizing our migratory history. These are some of the ideas I'm working through in my Iceland journals, but it's all weaved together through a more coherent travel memoir sort of narrative. I take you through my experiences traveling through Iceland going through the university programs, learning about Icelandic history, learning about my own genealogy family history, and then I tie it in to the grander history of humanity. And as I take my mind and pursue these thoughts to my utmost limits of intellectual capabilities, it's a very interesting process. And I think so far within the writing that I've been doing on this, it is creating a very compelling narrative, an interesting story, and lots of philosophical dead ends where it takes us through as far as we can go thinking that idea through, and then it sort of ends there, leaving me and leaving you, the reader, left to sit and ponder like, whoa, where does this go? There's a lot of questions about humanity that uh, we don't know how far we can take those questions. We don't know where to find answers. There's a lot of mysteries within human life. And I personally love when I'm able to read books that encapsulate the mystery and that leave you thinking, whoa. I also love books where I learn tidbits from. And so as I've traveled through Iceland, all over every day, it was a lot of like, wow, I didn't know that. That's a very cool fact. So that is incorporated into the book as well. Lots of little tidbits and factoids along the way with a lot of philosophical threads that go in many different directions, encapsulating all of the cool dynamics of human history and ideas about where humanity is headed going forward. And that book I have the most closest to completion. And as I go back to Iceland very soon, in just a matter of weeks, and as I spend the next almost three months there, I'm going to finish this writing, and I'm going to pursue the publication process while I'm in Iceland. Iceland has some of the most authors per capita. Iceland has a very literary culture, and so I think what better place than to attempt to publish my book, my first book, while I'm in Iceland. Now, on the topic of book publishing. I think it is very, very interesting to go through this process, attempting myself to be a first time publisher, breaking into the literary world, right now during a time of the advent of AI. 
different tools such as Google's Bard or OpenAI's ChatGPT. The advent of these technologies being readily available to all of us is so fascinating and so life-changing. And it's really ponderous to consider the implications this has on the authorship process. And so not only is there a lot to learn and figure out in the world of book publishing, but even more so right now when in many ways these artificial tech artificial intelligence technologies are capable of writing so many words and so much. Now, I've toyed around a lot with this myself and you know, unless you're willing to just write something very generic or very robotic, uh, it, it's hard to get these systems like ChatGPT to write an entire book for you. You know, I think it's just easier to just do the writing on your own. The amount of adjustments you would have to do in the prompting process to just get it to write exactly what you're wanting it to write, you just should write it on your own. So we're not at a point where everyone's going to be able to write their own books willy-nilly. But certainly going forward into the next months and years, these technologies are advancing at such a fast rate that who knows where it takes us. So thinking through how that has implications on authors is very fascinating. And something that is just adding to the complexities of things that I myself need to consider as I go through, personally, the book publishing process. But it's something that I think any and every author today needs to be thinking about deeply. You can't be writing and publishing books today without admitting and acknowledging the implications that AI has on the entire industry, on the books that are getting published, on the information that we are consuming. There's a lot of open questions that we all need to consider. And so I think the dialogue on that, I mean, that's a whole book in and of itself, thinking through the implications of AI on the way we digest and consume and distribute information. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to get distracted from my current writing projects to write a whole treatise on the advent of AI, but Certainly, as I'm going through my writing process and documenting it through videos like this and through social media, I want to continue to ponder this sort of question. I want to connect with other people in the writing industry and think about, learn about what they're thinking about and all the possible implications. Uh, so there's a lot to think about, uh, but that's sort of a broad and general update on the writing projects that I'm personally working on. Um, the the writing landscape that I'm working with, with this digital age and the advent of AI, as well as the physical landscape where, where I'm working. Uh, so my process of attempting to publish my book while well, I'm in Iceland as well. And I'm going to document the entire process along the way. I think that is one thing for authors during the age of AI very important would be to share all of the behind the scenes, what you're doing as you're publishing your book, how it's getting to market, how you're writing, how you're researching the things that you're writing. I think it's important to have that transparency today. Otherwise, as we do go forward, you know, I think any book that gets published from today onwards is subject to the scrutiny of the readers thinking, how much of this was written by AI? How much of this was not written by a human? I think every single book now going forward is going to have to be looked at through that lens. And so how do you address that? I think transparency in your writing process is going to be key, which is difficult because when I'm writing, I like to have the phone shut off, the computer put away, and just go in my own world while I'm writing. But at the same time, I wanna peel back those layers and video myself as I'm writing walk through my ideas and thoughts as I'm writing. So there's this tricky world uh, trying to work through all of this. And as I go through the book publishing process, working with an editor and an agent, all of those things, I wanna document that as well. Not so much to prove, oh look, I wrote this book, you know, this is not AI writing, but just to 
just to show the process, to pull back the curtains. Because myself, I mean, I want more videos like that. As an aspiring author, I would love if more authors were taking us all behind the scenes and showing the book publishing process. It would help me to learn what to do, how to do it. And so I'm doing it for that reason as well. But also, uh, again, in this advent of AI, I think it is important to show the human effort behind projects. Otherwise, you know, who knows what's happening behind the scenes of anything. And I think this is actually a way we um, fight fake the fakeness. You know, not that, well, th there's an open question, right? Is something, if something is written by AI, is it fake by definition? You know, these artificial intelligence are trained on what humans have already produced. It's sort of plagiarism in many ways. I've heard it referred to as AI writing is just plagiarism. You know, and I, I think that's a bit too crude as well. So again, you know, how do we describe these things? There's a lot to think through, but this is the landscape that I'm working with and I'm gonna continue to take you all along the journey. So stay tuned for more and uh, thank you for listening. Goodbye, everyone.